Hey folks, welcome to today's presentation. I'm really excited that so many of you have decided to sign up and really invest in anti-racist uh, education and movement here in Brighton. Um, I'm really thrilled to have Shane Wiegand here. Uh, Shane is a fourth grade teacher in the Rush Henrietta School District. He has researched, compiled, and taught Rochester's history of structural racism and resistance in his classroom for the past eight years. Starting with 10 fourth grade teachers in his school district, Shane has now trained over 200 teachers in anti-racist curriculum across five districts, Pittsburgh, Rochester, Rush Henrietta, Webster, and West Arondequoit. Should really get them over here in Brighton too, huh? Uh, based on the research and interviews conducted to develop his curriculum, uh, Shane has also created a lecture on the local history of redlining and has given hundreds of presentations to local civic organizations, nonprofits, congregations, and student groups. Shane is a board member of Connected Communities, Beachwood Neighborhood Coalition, the Police Accountability Board Alliance, and City Roots Community Land Trust. He is an adjunct faculty instructor at the URMC Department of Neurology, where he lectures, leads workshops around white fragility, and consults on equity work. He and his wife live in the Beachwood neighborhood of Rochester, and we are just thrilled to have you. Thank you, Shane. Thank you so much for having me, Kelly. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, hi, my name is Shane Wiegand, and I'm here to present uh, my presentation called Racist Policy and Resistance in Rochester. This presentation was really birthed out of questions by my fourth graders in Rush Henrietta, where I'm a teacher. One of my fourth graders during Martin Luther King Week uh, asked me, she said, did we ever have civil rights in Rochester? Do we have any of these problems like Martin Luther King did with segregation and discrimination in the South? Did that happen up here in the North? And I realized I didn't have any idea. I grew up in Webster schools, largely segregated, majority white, predominantly white school district, and realized I didn't have a good answer for my student. But I said, I'll look into it and get back to you. And I had no idea um, the story about our community that I would start to uncover, a story that was there, that people of color have always told and taught, um, but a story that um, had really been completely untaught by, to me, by my school and by my church um, and family and friends. And as I started looking, I learned about folks like Dr. Cooper and Alice Young and the Reverend Gibson, who's standing in front of City Hall in this picture you hear in 1962, leading what may have been the first Black Lives Matter rally um, in Rochester, although by a different name. And, and the story that I started to hear and learn about our community um, was a story that really challenged me. I felt defensive at times, and it really stood in the way of the story I kind of told myself, that me and my family had worked hard, and we had earned everything that we had, and no one had helped us. It was just our hard work. Um, and yet, I found that that story wasn't entirely true, that there was more to it. And I want to share a little bit about this story with you today. Um, and I want to talk about the story of folks who have resisted um, the racist policies like redlining in our community. And I want us to learn from their example and be inspired to work together uh, to build a better, a more just, a more beautiful and equitable Greater Rochester community, one that we're all incredibly proud to live in. So. A quick note, um, I am the co-lead of the Pathstone Foundation's Anti-Racist Curriculum Project with Principal Kelly McNair. Um, and a lot of this work uh, in this presentation uh, has gone into this curriculum that I've developed for my students and am uh, training teachers across Monroe County um, in how to tell the story with their students using primary sources. And I'll talk more about that later. He also noticed Dr. Cooper, Alice Young, and Pamela Hines, folks who have helped lead this work in our community for years, have been really influential on this project. Um, so for a presentation, a few quick sources that I want to talk about before we get going. The first is The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. I got to be a part of a committee with Pathstone uh, that brought him to Rochester last year and serve on a panel with him. Um, he actually went through and reviewed all these slides and a bunch of the curriculum work. Um, he found two mistakes. I had a name misspelled and a date off by one year, um, but it's fixed now. So we're officially very Rothstein friendly presentation uh, smiled upon by Richard. Uh, you'll also see a whole lot of stuff from the Democrat and Chronicle archives, the New York State Commission from 1958, the Public Library's Rochester Voices Project, and just hundreds of interviews that I've gotten to conduct um, and sit in on and learn from will be represented in here. 
a few quick definitions that are going to be important for us moving forward that I take from Ibram Kennedy's book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. He defines racism as a marriage of racist policies and ideas that produce and normalize racial inequality. He says racist policies are measures that produce or sustain racial inequity between racial groups, and anti-racist policies are any measures that produce or sustain racial equity between racial groups, laws, procedures, curriculums, regulations, and guidelines. And a quick thing that's so important to notice is that with all of these definitions, Kendi's not talking about your intentions or your good heart. I know for me in college, I expressed a racist idea uh, to a student of color where I said I didn't see color, I didn't see their race. And that student told me um, that 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 was a racist idea that I was saying, and it hurt them because part of who they are was their skin color. And that if I couldn't see that, I also couldn't see the things that make them special or the racism that, that um, has impacted them. And if I can't see them, I couldn't see the racism. My intentions were good, but it didn't matter because the impact of what I did was racist. And that's the focus that I want to focus on today is what is our impact? It's not about our intent. But what is the actual impact and policy change that we're going to be a part of creating in our community? I also want to note, it's going to be a hard conversation. You may feel some defensiveness. I know I did as I learned this story and have if, if come in contact with it. And this quote from the book, White Fragility, has really helped center me in this work. D'Angelo writes, the key to moving forward is what do we do with our discomfort? We can use it as a door out and blame the messenger, disregard the message. Or use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? And what would it mean for me if this were true? So I want to begin, though, with this, this really storied history that we have, one of fighting for freedom, um, one of great innovation, uh, one where we've had huge problems and we've come together as a community to solve them. And I know that we can do that again. We have folks like Frederick Douglass, who felt more at home here than anywhere else in the country. The great abolitionist, Austin Stewart, who was enslaved right down the road in Sotus, New York, and opened the first Black-owned business and Black school in the city of Rochester, as well as a spot on the Underground Railroad. The same with Reverend Thomas James, the first Black church, Memorial AME, where Tubman and Douglas attended, and where they fought for justice and integration and so many other things uh, in our community. Uh, a town like Brighton, uh, where the Thomas Warren Homestead, an abolitionist and spot on the Underground Railroad, um, great suffragists like Hester Jeffrey and Susan B. Anthony, who fought for the right for women to vote, and wonderful innovators like George Eastman, um, who taught us how to see the world in a different way. And yet some of how he saw the world was problematic and racist at times. And we're going to talk about that, too. Because the thing is, in Rochester, while we have this legacy of fighting for freedom, innovation, and overcoming challenge, we also have a huge challenge ahead of us. The incredible disparity that's laid out in the 2017 Act Rochester Hard Facts Report that finds African American children in our region are more than four times as likely as whites to live in poverty. And that both African Americans and Latinos are less than half as likely to own their own homes as their white counterparts right here in Monroe County less than half. How did we get to a place where when you look at the census map of our community in 2010, you see a sea of blue dots representing white folks and in a, in a concentrated area in a crescent shape in the inner city of Rochester where the majority of our black population is living. How do we get to a place where in New York State, we're the number one most segregated state when it comes to schools? And that in fact, in Penfield and Rochester, we have the number one most segregating school district border. In fact, Brighton, the boundary between Brighton and the city school district is the number six most segregating school district line in the entire United States, according to the 2020 Edville Fault Lines Report, which I can't recommend enough that you read. Ibram Kennedy says that white privilege is literally life itself, and that's true in Rochester, where a child from the majority white Pittsford 14534 zip code, born today, can live up to nine years longer than a child born in Rochester's previously redlined 14608 zip code. Nationally, we have a wealth gap. Uh, in 2011, the median white household had a net worth of 111000 compared to only $7,000 for the median black household. 
So what do we do? I just shared a lot of depressing and upsetting facts. Well, I think we have, what we have to do first is we have to recall our legacy of innovation and freedom. And I think we also have to do something that we've chosen not to do, and that's to face our history, to look at the policies that have created what we're at today, and to undermine the current racist policies in our community that continue to segregate and create inequality. The central thesis of my presentation today is this quote from James Baldwin who says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. It's important to note that people of color have always faced these problems and these racist policies head on, um, even when white folks chose not to do that, including folks from my own family. Meet Howard Coles, the editor of the Frederick Douglass Voice newspaper. People like Howard Cole spoke out with the power of the pen at city council by running for office, by showing people of color homes in white neighborhood as real estate agents. Howard Coles is really one of the fathers of civil rights in Rochester, almost a second Frederick Douglass. And they never learned about him growing up. And in 1938, he published a massive study finding that African Americans were being forced into two neighborhoods of the city of Rochester, that over 30% of the areas where they were living didn't have running water in their apartments. And he found that in some areas like Portland Avenue, over 50% of homes didn't have heating. Dr. Lunsford also spoke out. He was the first person of color to be a doctor in Rochester and he helped form the NAACP along with Dr. Knox and Harper Sibley and many other incredible folks. One of the things that they challenged was racism and health, health equity including at Strong Memorial Hospital, where they had segregated nurseries and where the medical school and nursing school wouldn't allow black students to be admitted. They spoke out in the paper and people didn't choose to listen. It took over 10 to 15 years for them to get change um, at, at the school. In fact, Dean Whipple, the Nobel Prize winner, whose name has recently come down off of many buildings at Strong and the U of R, um, because of these things for being an anti-Semite and a racist. This is one of the letters that he sent to people of color that tried to apply to the school, saying that they couldn't come to the school because they'd have to examine white women during their obstetric rounds. And this is from the 1939 New York State Commission. It took Dr. Lunsford and others' efforts to finally eventually get to the place where they got the state to threaten to take away the U of R's tax exemption. So Whipple and U of R were forced to allow one person of color in each year. To this day, there have been around 87 to 90 people of color or black males who have graduated from the University of Rochester Medical Center um, School of Medicine. It wasn't just Whipple. They had a segregated nursery up until the early 1960s, according to the Rochester Journal of Medicine. And according to Dr. Walter Cooper and his wife, Helen, when she gave birth to her first son at Strong Hospital, she was had to do it on a segregated and unequal ward. Dr. Cooper said in an interview um, that as soon as they returned home, they vowed never to use Strong Hospital again after the separate and unequal treatment that they received there. The second black doctor in Rochester, Anthony Jordan, in 42, found direct links between housing and health equity, finding that in Rochester, the black death rate from all causes is 50% higher than that of whites, and the tuberculosis death rate among people of color in Rochester was two and one half times that of whites. And the headline in the DNC when the report was published was that poor housing was directly linked to these high death rates. When people didn't give up, they continued this struggle and tried to face head-on racist policies in the real estate industry with racially restrictive covenants, redlining, and the VA and FHA backed mortgages that came out of the 1934 National Housing Act, urban renewal, and exclusionary suburban zoning policy. Today, we're going to take a look at each of these areas of racist policy. We're going to look at the folks who fought them and try to understand these policies and how they played out specifically here in Rochester and in regards to exclusionary zoning, how they continue to play out today and segregate our community. A note about the time period. We're covering the 1910 to 1970 period called the Great Migration when millions of African Americans fled the South out uh, of flee white domestic terrorism from the Klan and white citizens councils, searching for better jobs and all kinds of opportunity that they didn't have in the South, and yet often were still denied in the North. A majority of folks from Rochester of color came from Sanford, Florida, actually where Trayvon Martin was murdered, 
um, where Jackie Robinson was run out of town when he tried to play baseball there. Um, and they came fleeing racism, and they came to, to, to find better jobs. Um, but Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, they wouldn't hire folks of color. Instead, they came to pick fruit uh, out in Webster, Brighton, Hilton, and in other places in Rochester suburbs, and eventually made their way into downtown Rochester's third and seventh wards, where they were steered by folks in the real estate industry, like president of Rochester's real estate board, Frank A. Drum, who was responsible for enforcing the National Association real estate board code of ethics that said on the first page they followed the golden rule and part of following that golden rule as a real estate agent was to make sure this was done for over 30 years until 1956 their code said a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing into a neighborhood a character of property or occupancy members of any race or nationality or individuals whose presence would be detrimental to property values in that neighborhood. And this was the law uh, for real estate agents until 1956. Howard Coles fought this law. He got his real estate license and showed people of color homes in white neighborhoods. He was forced to do that at night by the real estate board and eventually resigned in protest because of the ill treatment he received and the way the local board enforced this racist policy against him and others who dared to stand against it. Dr. Cooper experienced this in 1954 when he and his wife answered ads for 69 apartments and were refused at all of them, even though they both had master's and doctorate degrees and could have been able to afford anywhere in Rochester. And yet, when they went to white neighborhoods, they were denied. Alice Young, who in 62 became the first black principal in Rochester. She had her doctorate, her husband had a great job, an upper middle class black family, decided they want to move into the 19th ward to have a little more space, a bigger yard. And so what she did is she went to the real estate companies and not a single one would show her a home in the 19th ward. She went to the banks and no bank would pre-approve her and her husband for a mortgage in a white neighborhood like the 19th Ward. So she did what people of color, the 57 during this period of time that made it out of those two neighborhoods and were able to purchase a home did. They found a wealthy white person, usually from the NAACP, like Harper Sibley of the Western Union Telegraph Fortune, um, who actually uh, went and bought a house, sight unseen, uh, the, 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 the Youngs never got to go in. Sibley bought the house for them and sold it to them under the table. And the Youngs moved in in the middle of the night because they knew that there was going to be pushback. And sure enough, the next day, they found a note in their mailbox with an incredibly offensive racial slur signed by the Ku Klux Klan demanding they leave. They faced numerous amounts of abuse. When I've had lunch, though, with Dr. Young, she's asked me to always tell in her story the white family across the street called the Bushes. The Bush family was the only white family on the street that stood up for them, stood with them, and eventually helped them get the FBI involved. And because of them and because of the Young's tireless efforts, uh, bravery and strength, they, were, they stayed in that neighborhood for 17 years. We often don't think about the Klan in Rochester, but this is the Democrat and Chronicle in 1926, a gathering of fully robed hooded 8,000 Klansmen gathering in East Rochester, right next to where the football field at the East Rochester High School is. The following year, over 20,000 Klansmen from all across New York State gathered here. Their main meeting place was what is where the Riverside Hotel is downtown right now. Um, a wild fact about our community, but something that, that persisted up, up through uh, until the 1980s, when the Klan would burn crosses in people of color's front yards um, in Gates Chilai and Henrietta, all published in the Democrat and Chronicle. The next area of racist policy is something called a racially restrictive covenant. We all know the public symbol of the black and white um, water fountain, the public symbol of segregation. But just as public, but a less in your face symbol of segregation, um, and actually a law just like these, is something uh, called a racial covenant in a deed. So when anyone buys a house, you get a piece of paper called a deed that says you own the house. And in the deed, there's rules. Oftentimes there's rules that you, you know, how far your sidewalk has to be from the street, that you can't have pigs in your backyard or a distillery, 
rules. I'm kind of glad that, you know, my neighbors aren't brewing up a, a massive batch of vodka next door that might explode, right? Um, but one of the rules that was super popular um, nationwide and especially in Rochester was called a racial deed restriction that permanently barred people of color from ever owning, occupying, or residing in one of these homes. In fact, I strongly encourage you to read the recent report by City Roots Community Land Trust and the Yale Environmental Protection Clinic. I got to help write and research for this report, um, as did my students, and it's an incredibly powerful and damning look at the way racial covenants, thousands of them across the county, help segregate our community um, and enforce uh, segregation and racist policy. In fact, this was de jure segregation done by the county executive himself and the county legislature. This is County Manager Smith, who, who reigned from 36 to 1959. And when they sold foreclosed properties, especially in Irondequoit, he personally made sure that all of those homes had the deed restriction that no person of any race other than the Caucasian race shall use or occupy these buildings. This is 1939 and 1940, de jure segregation from the county government. You'll see this though all throughout, Spencerport, even school districts, uh, the Thomas Edison School, number four, which is in the Gates Central School District, three school board members signed into the deed that it said no lot shall ever be occupied by a member of any race but the Caucasian. So this school was an explicitly whites only school. In Brighton though, there's quite a legacy of racist deed restrictions, number two to Irondequoit, which we'll get to. In fact, neighborhoods like Meadowbrook that still to this day on their website don't acknowledge this history, but do acknowledge that there's 371 homes, first tier and a carefully planned development. What Meadowbrook's website unfortunately leaves out is that it was so carefully planned that when it was built by Kodak and financed by ESL Bank, which was formed to finance these homes and the construction of them and these mortgages, and every single lot, or at least the majority, Harry Haight, vice president of Kodak and founder of ESL, wrote, no lot or dwelling shall ever be occupied or sold by a person of color. In fact, Kodak didn't just discriminate with its homes. In 1939, they were called out by the New York State Commission, saying that of their over 16,000 employees, they only had one black porter. And that in Rochester's firms, of their over 35,000 employees at all the firms, only 70 black people were able to be hired to work at factories. Um, Kodak leading by example or leading the way. Council Rock Estates, this entire neighborhood, over 247 lots, Grafton Johnson wrote into those deeds this restrictive covenant and advertised it in the Democrat and Chronicle. If you look at the bottom, it says rigid restrictions for desirable social character, meaning white upper middle class. Pittsford had these two. This is East Avenue Estates, also advertised as rigidly restricted, the whole neighborhood next to Oak Hill. Parrington and East Rochester, they had these as well, as well as the Fair Acres neighborhood um, in Fairport had them. In Irondequoit, over 2,000 homes in the Somerville Fruit Farm area had this deed written into them. Um, and even Walter Wegman, uh, the founder of Wegmans, he and his wife, uh, when they bought their home, they agreed to this racist deed. And when they sold it, ensured that that deed stayed in, even though it could have been taken out. Webster in the Forest Lawn neighborhood, denying Italian and Polish people from living there, as well as black. Penfield, you can see Gates, over 250 homes, put in by the head of the Rochester Builders Association, Norman Huck. This is the head of the Rochester Bar, Earl Case, who also put these into the homes that he and his firm built, um, saying no person other than the Caucasian race could live there. Um, you can see here in Greece, Dewey Stone, Tona, even the city, Beechwood, North Winton, Browncroft neighborhoods, as well as the 19th Ward, where Judge Reuben Davis, who became eventually the first black judge in Roch Rochester, describes the way he faced these, saying, my wife and I were looking for a house. It was in 1958, and we saw a house that we liked on 135 Elm North Ave in Rochester, just a block or so west of Genesee Street. I'd say that there were probably four black families that lived anywhere west of Genesee Street at that time. The owner refused to sell to us because we were black, and there was a restrictive covenant in the deed that these houses, when built, were not to be sold to black people, 
or to Italians. Judge Davis eventually bought that home, but the way he did it was by finding a white friend to buy the house for him and then sell it to him under the table. A note about Italians, Polish, and Jewish folks, they were not deemed Caucasian um, until 1944. The GI Bill in 1944 legally made Italians, Jewish, and Polish, and Eastern European folks officially white, meaning the federal government would finance mortgages for them to be able to buy homes in suburban neighborhoods, where previously the eugenics and race science of the time uh, put folks from those places or backgrounds um, in a lower category, and below them, people of color. And they were just, that was a legal description that changed again in the 1944 GI Bill. And there's a whole lot more on that that you could look up yourself. Some of the covenants that we found, you can take a look at the map right here. Almost every single town in the county has these covenants. And these black spaces um, represent entire suburban housing tracts and city tracts where almost every home has one of these. You can find yours. And look up your own deed at the county clerk's office. They'll definitely help you. The next area of national policy and racist policy is the National Housing Act of 1934. Now, it's, it's the wake of the Great Depression. Uh, uh, FDR and Senator Wagner, both from New York State, um, they're in power and they decide we got to help uh, people deal with this housing shortage, this housing crisis that's going on, and we got to fight communism. So what they decided to do is they passed this huge sweeping law, um, the Housing Act. Um, which created like the suburbs as we know it. it. It created the FHA mortgage. It set aside over $119 billion in federal subsidies. Um, and it created that low interest, low money down uh, mortgage that was something that really wasn't accessible to working class folks. But all of a sudden, thousands and really millions of working class people now had access to federally backed loans and a massive government subsidy except only some people were allowed to have these, explicitly white people, written into the underwriting manual by Francis Babcock, who in 24 actually wrote the book on racial assessment and mortgage policy um, in Chicago, uh, was hired to explicitly take his beliefs and racism and build it into this law, writing that if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it's necessary that properties continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. The racist idea to justify is that a change in social or racial occupancy generally leads to instability and a reduction in values. It goes on, though, saying in 39 that deed restrictions like the ones you just saw should be imposed on all land. If you want federal financing to build your suburban housing tract like the Levitt brothers did, they had to put in, or Norman Huck did in Gates, they had to put in racial deed restrictions after 1939 to get federal financing to help buy their materials up front. And those deed restrictions had to prohibit the occupancy of properties except by the race for which they were intended. In fact, highways and parks were encouraged to separate inharmonious racial groups um, and prevent the expansion of inharmonious uses, which is how we get something like 490 in the inner loop, separating black neighborhoods from white. So I want to pause and give us some language to think about these racist policies, because often it's not an FDR or a Senator Wagner from New York that we think of as, as the creators of one of the biggest racist policies in our country. We prefer to think of that as a George Wallace, right, or, or, or some angry guy in the South. But Ibram Kennedy says this. He says, time and again, powerful and brilliant men and women have produced racist ideas in order to justify the racist policies of their era. Put another way, in the book, So You Want to Talk About Race, the author writes, the ultimate goal of racism is the profit and the comfort of the white race, specifically of rich white men, which I would include myself in and my father and both of my grandfathers, whose wealth is largely based out of government subsidies. Both of my grandfathers received GI and FHA mortgages with zero to little money down that were 30-year FHA subsidized mortgages. The government gave them a handout and allowed them to buy a home. They were able to take those homes, build equity and wealth, buy bigger homes, build more equity and wealth. Both of them were able to help send my parents to college. They helped send me to college. Um, when problems happened or medical emergencies, they always had that house and that equity to fall back on, um, to rely on to get them through those times of crisis. For me, when I crashed my car right out of college and didn't have the money to fix it, 
I mean, the next day I had a check to be able to pay for that repair. And that's the difference between wealth and income. And when you remember that stat in the beginning about the wealth gap um, in America being a median white families at $111,000 compared to only $7,000 in, in wealth for black families, you can see it being directly linked back to these racist housing policies that denied people of color access for several decades uh, to the ways that the majority of Americans are able to build wealth. Um, and while I didn't do this, I benefited from it. And it's my responsibility and our responsibility to know the story, to own it, and to be a part of being able to undermine it and build a more equitable society. So let's understand how this policy was implemented. The way it was was through something called redlining. The 34 Housing Act created these maps. This is Rochester's redlining or residential security map that rated every neighborhood in, in almost every city in the United States to determine where people of color should live and which neighborhoods should be invested in and which should not. Green and blue neighborhoods were best or desired neighborhoods, meaning white, upper middle class, yellow areas, um, and declining, maybe immigrant families lived there, day laborers, maybe the houses were older stock, and red meant hazardous because people of color, Italians, or Jewish folks lived in those neighborhoods. So you can see at the top, the seventh ward, that was a big Jewish neighborhood in Joseph Avenue, um, but it was also around 20% African American, and that's why it was deemed hazardous. Um, and near the bottom left, you can see Corn Hill. Um, that was uh, the majority African American neighborhood. You can actually see the Corn Hill Assessor's Report right here. That Clarissa Street area was 75% black, 10% foreign, and it wasn't infiltrated. It had already been infiltrated, so they didn't have to label it that way. But compared to Pittsburgh, um, you can see 0% black, quadruple the income of the people who live there, and 0% foreign families. Um, and the homes in that neighborhood today are worth more than quadruple what the homes in the third ward are worth today. Also a way that wealth happens. If you want to look at the ways redlining and racial covenants work together, this map does a really great job helping you take a peek at how that happened. Meanwhile, all of Rochester's suburbs at this time, you have to remember, these were really small little towns and villages with five to 10,000 people living in most suburbs. Um, and the suburbs in the 30s were able to expand and literally explode in size because of this massive government subsidy. Um, but they were also segregated. They were green-lined whites only. And in 1960, to show you the extent and impact of how well these racist policies worked, there were only 11 individual people of color living in Henrietta. And that, according to the DNC, was the most integrated suburb of Monroe County. Thanks to Dr. Walter Cooper and his friends at the NAACP, who challenged this racism and decided to move together into Henrietta in solidarity to push back against these policies. To give you some more scope and scale, in Color of Law, Rothstein writes, the FHA and the VA, they insured half of all new mortgages nationwide during this period, half. And in fact, they gave out over $119 billion in mortgage insurance. You can see right there, Alfred Gerdes breaking uh, ground on whites only apartments in Brighton. In fact, over 35 million families benefited from these FHA and these VA backed loans. And of them, 98% were white. Let that sink in, those numbers and that impact. And then when you look at the current disparity we see today, we can make a direct link to these racist policies. But then you gotta ask yourself, and people often do, well, Rochester, this happened to us. We didn't want this in Rochester. We didn't ask for this. We're the home of Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony and, 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 and folks like Thomas, Thomas James and all these other incredible freedom fighters. How could we be a place um, that, that would want this kind of racist policy? Well, almost every elementary school, high school, Rotary Club, Kiwanis Club, Catholic and Protestant Church, Town Hall, um, from the 1900s to the 1960s, up until almost 1968, had, an an had annual fundraisers that were called blackface minstrel shows. And at these shows, people would dress up in blackface. Excuse me, there were four main characters. You had Jim Crow, you had Jim C-O-O-N, you had Jim Dandy, Mr. Bones, and sometimes an old black Joe. 
People would draw on garishly painted red lips. They would dance and sing Confederate songs and mock the intelligence of people of color and send a very clear educational messages to kids in their schools and adults in their community that segregation and white supremacy is the norm. And the Democrat and Chronicle, places like the Honeyway Fall Times, they would cover these, these, these shows. They'd post pictures of these shows and celebrate the amazing work that these parents and these children were doing. This is the Cub Scouts at Honeyway Falls in 1960. These kids are likely still alive to this day. And this is what they were taught growing up in school. Brighton High School in 1947 put on its annual minstrel show in blackface called Licorice Lights, um, right there uh, in the high school stage, celebrating the song and dance of the Dixie Land Band. This is RCSD at school number five with the return of Old Black Joe. Greece, Britain Road Elementary in the 50s, kids proving that they too can dress up in blackface as their teacher, Mrs. Betty Davis, proudly said in being interviewed in the article. Kodak had an annual show and proudly published it in the Kodak magazine. In fact, uh, the Jewish Young Men's Association, the, J the JYMA, they had an annual show up until the late 40s where they would dress up in blackface and, and mock people of color's intelligence. In fact, in 41, there was an article in the paper um, that gave a tutorial for how to do your best blackface. Um, and you can see on the right um, the uh, Joe Levy in blackface on the bottom there. Allendale Private School in Pittsburgh had these annual shows in 48 and 49. Um, some of the biggest names in Rochester participating in these shows. 1952, this is Newark, proudly published right in the Democrat and Chronicle. Um, RIT had an annual blackface minstrel show. And here are the other towns that had these shows across our county. And not just one show. These were shows that happened every single year in almost every single one of these towns in their schools and communities, teaching an explicit message of racism and, and segregation. In fact, the NAACP for over 10 years actively campaigned against this, writing letters to school districts, folks like Flora Harris, Harper Sibley, Quentin Primo. They wrote letters to schools and even this letter to the editor that really gets at the heart of what I'm trying to share here and give context for how the, these policies played out. They write in the DNC, Blackface shows must be banned from all public and private schools, churches, and public buildings. To do otherwise will cripple permanently the attitudes of all the white youth involved in these community accepted shows towards all of the dark skinned people of the world. Rochester was a place where white supremacy was the norm. In 58, the New York State Commission Against Discrimination comes out. Activists like Coles and Cooper and others had fought and fought, and instead of anti-racist policy, they got what we often get, another commission, another report. And while it didn't help them too much at the time, it helps us understand from a statistics perspective, from a data perspective, how big the impact of redlining, racial restrictive covenants, and racial steering by real estate agents had on people of color in Rochester. In the 50s in Monroe County, 80% of all people of color lived in those third and seventh wards. In those two neighborhoods, more than 16 units had either no bathroom or a shared bathroom, and in over 2,000, more than one person was living in each room. In fact, this redlining led to massive overcrowding and was one of the biggest reasons Connie Mitchell ran for office and became the first person of color to be elected in Monroe County. Describing the situation, she said, we were living in a community bursting at the seams because there wasn't open housing. When John and I bought our house in Greg Street, the real estate agent said, I can't show you houses west of Jefferson Avenue. They're not open to black people. We were confined from Jefferson Avenue back to the river to look for a place to live on the west side of the city. The report found that in these two neighborhoods, 30% of all units had no running water. If you're listening close, you'll remember Howard Cole said the same thing, or almost a little worse, in the 1930s with his report. 20 years later, nothing had changed. 57 black families were able to move and buy a home outside of these two neighborhoods, including the Wells, the Lees, the Biases, and a few other families that were able to make it out of those neighborhoods and buy a home, almost all finding a white person to help them buy the house um, and do some kind of straw man under the table deal. In fact, the report looked into it and found that not a single FHA or VA loan was given to any person of color 
in any of Rochester suburbs. So that massive government handout that was 98% to white folks was not being given to people of color in Rochester and was completely denied in areas like the suburbs, which were experiencing huge booms. In 2017, Barrow Architecture did a historic survey of Pittsburgh, where they said the new bank lending practices from the government housing programs that I just talked about, they promoted single family suburban housing and allowed dramatic growth where Pittsburgh went in 1950 to 70 from 9,000 residents to over 25,000 residents, all of whom were white. And given the opportunity to build wealth to have their homes grow incredibly in value over time and appreciate and build massive wealth. Meanwhile, when folks of color tried to push back and move into these neighborhoods, they faced move-in violence and resistance. Meet the Bias family. Dr. Bias and Ermina, they moved into this a home in West Rondecoit. Quickly, they had rocks thrown through their front window. They were threatened with their life. So they sold their home and they joined the Coopers and the Lees and the Wells in Henrietta, where things were a little bit safer. Peter Tolliver of Verena Drive in Brighton. He tried to buy his house. They had a handshake agreement. He put some money down, but then two of his neighbors, including I think a next door neighbor, they went to the bank and they bought, they pooled together money from a bunch of neighbors and they tried to buy the house out from under him. He had to sue with help from the NAACP, even the county supervisor uh, Howe got involved with the whole thing. 60 out of 350 Brighton neighbors in the neighborhood signed a letter condemning the acts but only 60 out of 350 people signed that letter, which I think is super interesting. Tolliver was an amazing scientist and engineer and even invented these really cool peripheral lenses. My fourth graders loved this picture of Tolliver with his crazy glasses on. Those were pretty cool. Quentin Primo, um, he was the head of the NAACP. You may remember him for standing out, uh, standing up against the racist blackface shows. He led uh, protests against police brutality, uh, like this one at CORE that's happening uh, downtown with Flora Harris and many others. Uh, participated in the Freedom Rider movements. When he and his family tried to buy a home off of Empire Boulevard in East, uh, East Irondequoit, um, their entire neighborhood signed a petition saying they didn't want the bank to sell them the home or give them the home because that they were dirty and loud and weren't going to treat the neighborhood well. Whereas he was uh, an Episcopalian minister downtown, I'm pretty sure that was his denomination, and the leader of the NAACP. And it's just this is just a few examples of the many like this that happened throughout our community. You often don't think this is Rochester, and yet it's right there in the Democrat and Chronicle. These are stories we've chosen not to tell, but stories that I think we have to own as a community. We have to look at, we have to accept this as part of our history, and we have to take the steps to move forwards. Because meanwhile, folks like Max Farish, Frank Drum, Norman Huck, and many other builders made millions. By 73, Farish had made over $100 million, money that he couldn't have made without these federal subsidies that were only accessible to white folks. Now, he had that benefit of these massive government subsidies. There, there is no big black builder um, in Rochester the way we do we have with white builders in, in our community. Another area, though, I want to focus on is public housing. Um, a bunch of public housing was built in the 40s and 50s, and much of it was only for white folks and white veterans. Um, Elmer Milliman, the man on the left, Mayor Dicker, the man in the, with the shovel in the middle, and on the right, Alfred Gertis, you remember from the bulldozer, they built several public housing that was whites only. Howard Coles actually would get black veterans who are married with children, and met all the requirements. And he would help them send in their letters so that they were perfectly done um, in their applications. And every time Elmer Milliman or the mayor would deny them um, the opportunity to live in one of these publicly funded public housing units and said only white folks could do it. And they could save up money and then they could be able to buy that FHA mortgage home in the suburbs. This is Brighton Manor, uh, which I think is called Brighton Gardens today. Um, and these houses were also whites only when they were built. Um, Howard Coles and his friends tried to apply to get people of color to be able to live there. And all of them were denied, at least in the beginning of the time period. Meanwhile, black public housing was built in the seventh ward. 
Originally, they tried to build it in the white neighborhood of the 22nd Ward, um, but a group of white folks at Benjamin Franklin High School, uh, when the state representatives came out, they rioted in the auditorium, breaking things, smashing chairs, freaking out, screaming. And Councilman Nagel, who you can see there uh, in the middle, who's standing up, he actually decided right then and there, yep, we're not going to build it in this white neighborhood. We're going to build it in the 7th Ward as part of our urban renewal project. A black neighborhood was torn down, and these seven seven-story uh, towers were built called the Hanover Houses. But enough money wasn't set aside to, for maintenance for these buildings. They had one janitor for all seven seven-story towers. Um, they didn't maintain the grass. Um, and it led to some really difficult conditions. Um, and it wasn't enough housing to make up for what had been taken away. Meanwhile, almost no affordable housing was built in the suburb. Ed Doherty from Act Rochester has said that any of that public housing in the suburbs is almost primarily for older folks or folks with disabilities, and a tiny portion um, is applicable for low-income families. The final piece, or the second to final piece I want to talk about is urban renewal and displacement. Really early forms of gentrification in Rochester. Um, in the seventh ward, 886 families were displaced from their homes. In the third, 850 families. And in the Savannah Street neighborhood, uh, where Strong Museum is today, that was a majority uh, diverse black neighborhood. Over 350 families were displaced from those neighborhoods. And, there, and an equal number of houses were not built in that place to house those folks, which led to massive overcrowding in the seventh and third ward neighborhoods. Um, and a whole lot of problems. Um, this was a period of time when buildings and homes were raised um, so that the highways and the inner loop could be built, um, as well as business de development downtown and some of the public housing towers like Hanover or the Savannah Street, uh, Manhattan Square Towers. Uh, the people in charge of this were Elmer Milliman, who you may remember from earlier, and the man on the right, John Dale from the city. Elmer Milliman was the president of Central Trust Bank, and he and Dale wouldn't allow Howard Coles or any black person on the original Urban Renewal Committee to have say and voice in this process, even though it was open to the public and was supposed to be open to the public. To give you one example of the way this urban renewal um, destroyed the social fabric is the story of Pepsi um, uh, and their factory uh, that got built in the place where the Church of God in Christ uh, had been for over 20 years. The Reverend Caldwell, pictured on the right in 1940, he and his congregation opened their church, and it became a hub in the neighborhood, a meeting place, a place that knit the social fabric together in the Seventh Ward, Red Line neighborhood. In fact, People in that neighborhood, even though things were tough, even though there wasn't often heat or running water and there was lots of uh, segregation and oppression, people found ways to live together. People, people said that they liked living in those neighborhoods. Um, over on Clarissa Street, uh, Clarissa Street was like, it was like the Black Wall Street of Rochester. It was this like jazz mecca, an incredible place with a Pithid Club and other amazing places um, where people gathered. Um, and really in integrated settings oftentimes. But when Urban Renewal came through, it caused an end to this. That church was knocked down and Pepsi was given a subsidy to build a million dollar factory um, in that land. Um, and uh, Frank Staropoli uh, Jr., I've gotten to interview him about this, um, and he told me that when um, that factory was built, they never hired a black person to work there, but that some Puerto Rican folks were hired. Um, and so it, it really was something that was a tough thing uh, for our community. Another area, though, is, is police brutality. And I just want to touch briefly on this. You saw that picture in the beginning of Reverend Gibson. Reverend Gibson and his church and, and, and other activists were outside of City Hall in 1962 protesting because the man on the right, Rufus Farewell, who's sitting in a wheelchair, was brutally beaten as he tried to lock up the gas station that he managed on Plymouth and Columbia Avenue in the Red Line Third Ward. That part of the neighborhood was a white part of the neighborhood. The police didn't know why a black person would be there. Um, so instead of talking to him or anything, they brutally beat him, um, arrested him. And thanks to this protest, he received a significant amount of compensation. Um, but it's, it was just the beginning of tensions. Um, there was lots of brutality related uh, to the Nation of Islam in Rochester, um, A.C. White, and a whole other a number of stories like that that led to quite a bit of tension. So this all boils over in Rochester, just like a majority of other northern cities. In the red line neighborhoods of Rochester, there was a massive uprising where people took to the streets in protest. Um, and County historian Carolyn Vaca has found uh, by looking at the arrest records and census data that the people who were arrested 
the people that got the most intense with their protest were folks who had been directly impacted by displacement and losing their homes and neighborhoods, folks who didn't have running water in their census tract, and the people who had been victims of police brutality. The uprising lasted for three days. Almost a thousand people were arrested. 1,500 National Guard troops came out, and majority white-owned businesses were targeted um, for the exploitation that was happening in some of these neighborhoods. There were certainly casualties. There were certainly difficult things that happened. Um, there's lots of tension and different perspectives on it. But I definitely would say this. You don't have this uprising without urban renewal and displacement, without not making sure that people had access to basic needs like running water, and without um, equitable and just policing in those neighborhoods. Russia wasn't alone, though. Almost every city had an uprising like this in their red line neighborhoods nationwide. And when Dr. King was assassinated in 1968, LBJ and Walter Mondale used that to ram through uh, the third rail of civil rights reform, the Fair Housing Act, which um, outlawed redlining and racially restrictive covenants, gave people of color access to mortgages financed by the FHA and VA for the first time. Um, but the thing is, it didn't provide any reparation to make up for that lost time or wealth lost because of the previous law. And it only tasked HUD, the Housing and Urban Development, with affirmatively furthering fair housing. And if a community wasn't affirmatively furthering fair housing, all they could do to enforce was to take funds away uh, from sewers or road grants um, in those neighborhoods. The Fair Housing Act said that uh, affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, was the goal. Uh, and uh, when George Romney, uh, the secretary of HUD, under President Nixon, tried to enforce this Fair Housing Act in Warren, Michigan, uh, President Nixon actually ordered him to cease and desist, uh, flagrantly disobeying the law itself. Um, but he echoed the sentiments of what many at that time felt um, and what you might hear in many of our suburbs today. In 72, Nixon justified ordering this to be done and actually fired George Romney for trying to enforce the law because he said this, I'm convinced that while legal segregation is totally wrong, forced integration of housing or education is just as wrong. I realize this position will lead us to a situation in which black people will continue to live, for the most part, in black neighborhoods, and where there'll be predominantly black schools and predominantly white schools, like the one I grew up in and like many of our schools right here in Rochester, including Penfield, the number one most segregating school district in the country. Um, the final area we're going to focus on is 1960s to today, something called exclusionary suburban zoning. Now, one of the best ways that you can keep a community segregated and concentrate wealth in an area is by making sure that homes have to be a certain size and that lot sizes have to be a certain size and that affordable housing, townhouses, and apartments can't be constructed or built. And so there was a movement, um, almost an anti-civil rights movement in Rochester suburbs and across the country where white folks like this one came to town boards like Penfield's all white, all male town board and spoke out asking that towns take their loose zoning policy and make it very exclusionary. So apartments couldn't get built and so that small houses couldn't be built and that the suburbs would stay wealthy and residential single family home ownership. We actually know that this was specifically race based. In 1966, an excerpt from the town board meeting minutes, Walter Peter said that he had 46 residents call to ask if the proposal to include affordable housing in the town's land use plan was a wedge to bring black people into the town. He recommended officials listen to residents when it came to land use plans. And he um, and his friends on the board pushed through some of the most exclusionary zoning in the state, making Penfield number one when it comes to segregation and schooling. In fact, they were even taken in 75 all the way to the Supreme Court in Worth v. Selden. Penfield Homers Owners Association um, has sent around multiple petitions and letters to neighbors um, about the threat of people moving into their neighborhoods of color um, and their property values going down. Um, but then in 1968, after MLK was assassinated, Pittsburgh was, was still going full steam ahead with taking one-eighth of its undeveloped land and making it R1, top-grade residential, extremely exclusionary zoning. A group of white pastors in Rochester suburbs, including Pittsburgh, spoke out, including the Reverend Hughes, who described this plan in Pittsburgh. 
He's saying if the proposed plan to rezone over an eighth of Pittsburgh land to top grade residential passed, it would make the town an affluent, exclusive ghetto. Hughes and his friends lost. And, and that's honestly what Pittsburgh has sort of become. And it was really interesting. The reason he spoke out was this. He and his friends said, the death of King has made people here aware. We're very ashamed. We're angry. Now we're more sensitive. If this is bigotry, it's bigotry out of plain ignorance. So if he's saying that in 68, what can we say about what's happening right now in our community? The number of folks who, after the killing of George Floyd, have said, I just didn't know. I didn't realize it was this bad. People were saying the same thing in 68. And I think a big part of this is we've chosen to ignore our history, to not tell the truth. And if we don't tell this truth, there's no way that we reconcile and move forward. Seymour Share from the city wrote that the zoning ordinances in towns like Pittsburgh and Penfield are a reflection of the willingness of communities surrounding Rochester to allow residential living for all income groups, which has led us to a place today where our segregation in Rochester still follows that redlining map, where our suburbs are majority white, our inner city is majority black, Asian, and Hispanic, where poverty is incredibly concentrated right in those inner city redlined neighborhoods and wealth is dominant in Rochester's suburbs. Same when it comes to home ownership, food insecurity, and food deserts. We don't have a single Wegmans in any of those neighborhoods that were redlined in the city. Back in the day, there were in those neighborhoods. Um, but thanks to the FHA and, and the building of highways, um, groups like Wegmans and Tops can build their grocery stores um, and don't have that incentive to put in those neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods were disinvested um, and they continue to be disinvested and there, there just isn't stores and healthy food. The same with asthma being the highest in those previously redlined neighborhoods, high blood pressure and life expectancy being almost nine to 10 years difference um, between these different neighborhoods and areas. Notice that wealthy, racially restricted white eastern part of Rochester, um, the, the, the life expectancy rate is just so much higher than those red line neighborhoods of the city. Nationwide, these policies have left us with a massive wealth gap. Put another way, instead of medians looking at averages, Yale found that for every $100 the average white family has in wealth, the average black family has only five. It's going to take 228 years to earn the same amount of wealth that white families have today. So to summarize, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And I hope you've joined me today in facing racist policy in the real estate industry like Howard Coles did, the way Judge Davis fought back against racially restrictive covenants in the 19th Ward, the way Connie Mitchell stood up to redlining in the VA and FHA-backed mortgages, and Dr. Cooper and Alice Young, the way thousands protested in the street against policies like urban renewal. And maybe some of you here today will be a part of the fight against exclusionary suburban zoning policy and building a more just, diverse, and equitable Greater Rochester community. One of the biggest ways we can do this is by telling the truth and making sure that everyone in our community has the same facts about what happened here. One of the ways we do this is at the Anti-Racist Curriculum Project at the Pathstone Foundation, um, where our team of teachers has come together to develop resources for multiple grade levels so that teachers uh, can use primary sources and an inquiry-based model to help kids look at current day statistics around census data and hard facts, examine the redlining maps and those government policies and the FHA underwriting manual, take a look from different perspectives at the things that cause this, like racially restrictive covenants, oral histories of people of color that fought back, the New York State Commission, and to see the explicit racist things that happen in their school districts like minstrel shows. Um, one example of this of this this happening um, is is from my classroom. You'll you notice the girl in the middle, Kalia. She came up to me after learning this history in Rochester and said, "Mr. Wiegan, I think our school district, I think it's racist." And I was like, "How come?" She was like, "We don't have black teachers. I've never had a teacher that looks like me. That's not fair." I said, "You're absolutely right." That's a racist policy. And she said, let's go talk to the principal right now. And I was like, well, what did Howard Coles do? What did Dr. Cooper do? And she was like, well, they got friends together. 
um, and they researched things. They made sure they knew their facts. So we got Bailey and Simra. They came up at lunch every day, and the, the four of us, we worked hard researching. The girls built a presentation uh, with speaker notes and a slide deck that had these facts, finding we had only 11 out of black teachers out of, and 550 white teachers, that we had more black teachers than any suburban school district, um, and yet 11 was pretty bad. Kalyat's chances were incredibly low of having a teacher that looked like her. Um, we found that if you're a black student, you have one black teacher, your chance of graduating goes up 30%. So they wrote a letter to the principal. They asked for a meeting at lunchtime uh, to talk about a problem that they saw, and they presented this whole stuff. They told them about what they'd learned, the history, and about what they wanted as a change, an anti-racist change at our school and our district. They got to talk to the assistant superintendent of hiring and the school board, and I'm proud to share that because of these girls' activism and learning their community story, we now have a relationship with three historically black colleges in Atlanta, and are starting to develop a feeder pattern so that college has the teacher that looks like her that she truly deserves. We pulled together a great advisory committee with folks from across the community to advise to make sure that all voices are heard and that the story is told from as many perspectives as possible um, and kids have that chance to draw their own conclusions and have support in the ways they want to take action. There are a number of ways that you can take action, not just limited to these on this list, but a few things that I really want to push uh, for us to be thinking about, that if this, this talk has resonated with you at all um, and you feel compelled to take action, to make anti-racist housing policy a reality, especially in Brighton, I want to encourage you to sign up with through the Parks and Rec Department with the Brighton Town for the IDEA Board that's going to be held on Thursday, August 27th, and a second uh, meeting on September 26, where you can make your voice heard um, and ask for your town uh, to uh, institute anti-racist housing policies and their comprehensive plan and zoning regulations uh, to make lot sizes smaller, to allow for affordable housing to be built, um, to consider things like um, suburban uh, community land trusts uh, where existing homes could be purchased um, and then uh, permanently made affordable through something called a ground lease so that uh, low, lower income families could purchase those homes and when they sell them, build wealth and equity, but still sell them at a, at a, at a lower rate and an affordable rate to that next family uh, for the next hundred years, following the model of uh, an organization I'm a part of called City Roots Community Land Trust that does the same thing in the city of Rochester, but just to fight uh, against gentrification and to promote community control of land and neighborhood empowerment. You can support us by volunteering and helping us rehab the numerous zombie properties that we've purchased uh, to help invest in the Beechwood and Plymouth Exchange neighborhoods, two previously redlined areas of Rochester. Uh, we'd also more than welcome your donations to help us do that work and welcome you joining our committees and supporting the things that we're doing to promote housing justice in the city of Rochester. You can also join us at City Roots with our partner, the Citywide Tenant Union, who are always looking for folks to help knock on doors and organize apartment buildings uh, where slumlords are not taking care of the properties uh, and where they're looking to fight back uh, and, and, and really pass some awesome reforms. Um, one of the things that we're working together in was something called the Rochester Housing Justice Alliance that includes City Roots, Metro Justice, um, and it includes great organizations like REACH. Um, and uh, what you can do is come to one of our eviction blockades. We've had well over 100 people attend our eviction blockade training. Over last year, we had over 8,000 evictions in our community. Um, and what we want to do is say no more. And so when people get evicted, they can sign up to have us come out and form a human chain in front of their home to prevent the police from evicting them because we want our neighbors to be able to stay in their homes. And uh, if you want to learn how to do that, how to do that safely uh, in a way that is is, is more than uh, and acceptable, we've done this a bunch in, in the Beechwood neighborhood, especially with Liz McGriff, one of our board members. Um, come check it out. See if it's something that you'd like to support or be a part of. Um, another thing that you can be a part of is supporting the construction of affordable housing. Um, that's below 30% of the area median income. So often housing that's being constructed through LIHTC is around 50 to 70% of the area median income that's not affordable for many of the people in Rochester um, that just can't afford that housing. 
when we say affordable housing, it has a lot of different meanings. So you have to be careful that when you institute affordable housing policies in your town and construction projects, that there is space for folks who may are on that sort of lowest income level, below 30%. Um, that's going to be huge. Uh, finally, I think we have to talk about um, reparations. This is something that we need to make sure um, that we're really considering. I don't know exactly what it looks like. It could be something done through housing um, or setting aside ho current houses uh, for people to live in and have at reduced rates. It could be a you know, nationwide program, but it could also be something that every in individual um, organization can take a look at their past. For example, the Brighton School District, we saw today they had blackface minstrel shows in their, at their school. Like, have we wrestled with this past? Have we really spoken this truth to our students, um, um, wrestled with that history, um, and, and been a part of making reconciliation and reparation and change in those policies? Um, I think we can do the same things with our towns, our neighborhoods, like the Virginia Colony, which was very anti-Semitic, or places like Verena Street with the Tollivers or Meadowbrook, where on their website they still don't acknowledge these racist deed restrictions that permeated that entire neighborhood when Kodak built it. I think we have to look at this, not to shame or to punish, um, but to kind of bring out, to call out into the open, to name it, to own it, to say this happened. We don't want this to happen again. And if we're going to move forward, we have to own this history. We have to talk about it with our families and friends and the places uh, that we worship, uh, the places that we call home, and start where we can to make these changes. You can always reach out to me at swiegand at pathstone.foundation, S-W-I-E-G-A-N-D, at pathstone.foundation, uh, with any requests uh, for support in this work. I'm so grateful to be here and looking forward to uh, answering your questions. Thank you. So we had a couple of questions uh, that were sent in when people were RSVPing, so I wanted to see if you could probably uh, have some input on them. Uh, so number one, what would you do if you feel as if you've been a victim of discrimination as, as far as housing or lending is concerned? Uh, one of the things you can do is go to the New York State Attorney General's website and uh, report that. You can go to uh, the Legal Aid or Law New York uh, and ask to get legal representation. Um, and hear from their attorneys and activists there uh, to support you in that process. If you're a tenant, you can definitely reach out to the Citywide Tenant Union. Um, their folks at St. Joseph's House of Hospitality are really incredible at helping people who have been discriminated against uh, or have had trouble um, with slumlords or bad landlords. Um, so they would be great places to go. Recommend following them on Facebook. Um, and those are some of the best ways to kind of get going, but make sure you're sharing your story and connecting to people who have been through it as well. And, and uh, those organizations are places that can connect you to the folks uh, who have fought against this, experienced it firsthand, and can help uh, come up with a plan to take action and to push back. It's probably really good to try and keep whatever documentation you have of that, whether that's an ad, you know, do a screen grab of it, or, or if there's an email, keep track of that. Uh, as well. Um, and you can go to the Housing Council website at Pathstone. They have a lot of uh, great stuff, guides to tenant rights, so you can know what to do um, and, and have a great way to sort of uh, make a plan and push back. And there's folks at the Housing Council that will also offer support. And it's a pretty easy to use website. There's some great stuff there. Also, Mark Moyo uh, is a really excellent resource for some of this stuff uh, out of legal aid. Fantastic. Um, so another question we had was, uh, and this is probably a, a longer answer, but if you can start us off with a short version and maybe give us some uh, hints as to who we might reach out to along with yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. What specific ways can we amend our current zoning to make housing more accessible? Uh, specifically, you need to make your lot sizes smaller. You have to decide what that looks like in your town, um, and you have to make it so that that the homes that can be, that can be built um, can be lower property values. I know that Brighton is pretty built out, so any any new areas that building can happen on, making sure that a specific amount of that area is set aside uh, for low income and affordable housing uh, that has you know, you know multi use, multi income, I think is really important to be thinking about. I think another thing that can explicitly happen is that Brighton could put dollars behind enforcing uh, its uh, income discrimination policies. Uh, and do testing, uh, and you could do that today. I think that would be really important to do. Um, and 
yeah, those two big things. The other thing is you really just need the political will to make that stuff happen and to build this momentum. And I strongly recommend reaching out to a Yale law instructor, Connor Dwyer Reynolds, who helped write the City Roots Community Land Trust, uh, Yale uh, Environmental Policy Center uh, report on racially deep restrictions. He's one of the leading experts in suburban zoning, and he literally almost wrote the book on that in Penfield. Uh, and learning about that and those specifics is going to be really important. It's not so important right now for me to tell you actual specific like, you know, like feet, square foot changes. Like you guys can figure that out with an expert, an illegal expert, um, and hire one of the firms that help with zoning. Zoning is one of those things that politicians, they, they make those changes, but it's the experts that kind of make the specific little decisions that are then voted on um, and explained. So getting folks like Connor Ry Dwyer Reynolds uh, would be really important to talk specifics. And then on the other end, building that um, that real push uh, in, in the town to have this, this strength behind making those kinds of changes, but also advocating at a county level uh, the, the, uh, for the county to make these sort of change, changes when it comes to zoning and land use. So in a town like Brighton, where we do have a lot of it that's already built up, um, would ancillary dwellings on existing properties, so like, for example, like an in-law apartment or a, a granny shed, <laughs> it's just the, the current fun name for them, but, uh, you know, an additional building on a property that has enough property to, to support it. That could be an opportunity for introducing. Definitely. I know Mary Lupian in the city of Rochester has pushed for that in neighborhoods uh, like the North Winton area that would really benefit from that. People could get a little extra income. You could definitely have, you know, you know, small apartments put in the side and, and allowing land use changes for that, those granny apartments. Actually, <laughs> that can be a, a real way to kind of help promote some housing integration. Um, and access uh, for folks. It's not it's not the only way, maybe not the mm -hmm. best way, but I think it can be part of a larger comprehensive solution with this area. I also think building a coalition. I know towns like uh, folks in Pittsburgh, folks in Fairport, they're working really hard to try to make these changes in their town. And if there's a multi-town coalition around this and around the importance of it, I think there's a lot of strength in that. So reaching out to leaders like Kevin Beckford uh, and Deputy Mayor Matthew Brown in Fairport, I think there, there could really be some, some strength for the county, a uh, bunch of towns going at this together um, and inviting other folks in uh, to be a part of sort of a coalition that's pushing for these policies and supporting one another with best practices. Excellent. Well, I, I think we've got some, some work to do. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, we're going to call it a night and thank you everybody for joining us and thank you, Shane. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs>